Anyway, thank you uh, and welcome to the Hunter Living History Showcase for August of 2023. I just want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Awabakal people and we send our um, respect both to elders past, present and emerging and welcome um, the ancestors here to these proceedings today. And we also wish to acknowledge um, the traditional lands of the people that you're zooming in from today as well and pay our respects to those elders past, present and emerging as well. And also any Indigenous First Nations people that are joining us today. Welcome. Um, this is a special presentation on the Hannon Archive, Hannon Photographic Archive, which is a massive um, collection of images which was donated in 2014. We're going to have a number of presentations um, just to basically update the community with the work that's been going on. And we've got a number of people who actually worked for the company that are either zooming in or here with us physically. Thank you very much for making the opportunity to come in. Have an update on the work of digitising this so massive thing, what's involved in the history of, of the creation of it as well. So, um, and it also helps us to gauge um, a contact list for people that we can ring up and, and uh, talk to if we have any troubles dealing um, through the archive itself. So anyway, um, to get the ball rolling, um, welcome everyone. And uh, the first person I'd like to uh, invite is uh, Dr. Amir Mogadam. He's our conservator. So Amir's been uh, busily rehousing the early part of the Hannah Necks. So uh, over to you. Okay. I wasn't thinking that I would be the first person. But, uh, yeah, where do we start? Um, thank you for attending this session. I think it is a great opportunity for me to meet the photographers, or at least a number of them, involved in those very, uh, in developing that very important collection. Um, it's a collection of, I think, I mean, I don't need to explain it to you, but uh, just to give some background on that, it's a collection of more than 50 years of constant working and archiving and millions of images from different um, photographers, but with a shared mission of documenting what was happening in Newcastle and, uh, and the region. And it is, I think in the last 20 years that I have worked in different institutions, uh, it's a, it's a, re like you, you never see such an intact collection, or at least you rarely see that. And it is a great opportunity for Newcastle um, to, to have that. So, so we have a, like a great deal of visual history of the region available to people. I mean, um, it takes time because with the work on the rehousing and accessioning and cleaning and all of that, it's only me and there are millions of images. So I, I, it, it, it's a great undertaking. And um, I, uh, yeah, like, and to give you a little bit of perspective that how much I have been, it's like we have reached uh, 850 images. So. Hello. That's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So about 900,000 something is left to do to go. <laughs> Which you should have done by Christmas. Yeah, yeah um, and then, um, but because of many considerations, just stop me when, when, when I have to stop, okay? Um, we, we have started from 1950s from different, like with different things in our minds. First thing is that these are the earlier photos that we have from, from the firm. In the time that we started it, we were concerned about um, like copyright and all of that. So 1950 was a safe zone uh, to start with. Um, and uh, these are the these are the negatives that are 
in kind of like they are in more danger. Like you can see the deterioration of the film happening uh, on on the negatives, and we are kind of uh, trying to rescue what we can and and. Uh, just reduce the speed of deterioration. I'm aware that it, like what I do here is not perfect because in perfect situation, you need to have cold storages, many people involved in it and all of that. And we don't have cold storage and we don't have all the required uh, infrastructure. But we are starting it with the hope that one day, that infrastructure comes to materialization. And um, we have all those um, images accessible to people. 1950s is very important for me because it's a post-war time. It's a, it's a time that Australia generally changes because of the migrations and all these inter-global movements in photography as that you can Tell me more about this than, than me. You have experienced some of you uh, those times. Um, but the other thing that is important for us is that the change of material. So it's almost like 1950s is a time that we moved to acetate films from the nitrate films. And lucky for us, most of the collection is acetate film because it was, if it was a nitrate, nitrate film, we had the uh, we have more difficulties with that. Um, so yeah, I, I leave it to uh, the rest of the team and I would be happy to have a chat if there was any questions, anything uh, for me at the end of the meeting. But to end, I would like to thank you all for providing such a great collection. And it's really an honor for me to, to be able to work on it. So thank you very much. Can I just say you need to move a bit faster? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so we're doing these as a series of posts on the Hunter Living History. So Amir was the first cap off the rank. So you also did a couple of interviews, I think, on yeah. radio as well. So we've got the radio interviews as well. So this has been something for the community to be involved with because look, it's, this stuff has got to be in partnership with the communities we're in. <clears throat> um, because there's no way that the resources of the university stretch out to, to something like this. Anyway, the next part of the project has been once the images have been um, have been um, properly rehoused and conserved and cleaned, and in some cases repaired. You didn't talk about some of those other images that you've been through that have been warped and yeah. artworks in themselves. Yeah, like um, in, in in some instances you have images disintegrating or blocking to each other. So a part of reason that the job is so slow is to carefully unblock the images or put together the disintegrated film so that we can scan them yeah. and digitize them. Yeah. The early end of this is the most scrappy part of it because we've got, we've got images coming from all over the place. We're not quite sure how they how they relate to the books that have survived, the registers. Mm -hmm. So they're things that we haven't been able to track any numbers to. So they're an unknown set. They could be from any part. So as they're digitising and we sort of start to post them online, then that community input then starts to come in. Just like the example that we did before, we were staring at when they first started, teams that first started digitising images, they just started flashing these images up on the screen. And um, something looked familiar. It was just like a big lot of dirt with a few buildings. And then uh, I just kept looking at it. It was like intriguing me. And I kept staring and staring. And next minute, I said, can we close up on the buildings? And I'm looking at the buildings and I thought, what is this, some kind of church or mining site or something? And then I, I saw the Cooksey Pine. And the Cooksey Pine was in Mayfield. It's where the new orphanage site was, or still River is now. Mm -hmm. And what it was was photographs of the construction of the industrial highway. Mm -hmm. So while they were bulldozing the highway into, into beginnings, mm -hmm. that's what those images were. So we then had a date. Then the process is we'll just go back and try and see what time is recorded in there and do the, you know, retrofit all the metadata back into the, mm -hmm. into the image. 
Anyway, that part of the job of, of scanning and documenting scanning registers has been um, through Dr. Anne Hardy and the Glamex Lab with the team of volunteers and working degrees. Learning students, over to you, Anne. Thank you. So I thought I'd just give an overview um, as to how much work's been done and who's been doing it and some of the processes involved. So we started probably mid last year um, with transcribing, there's 20 of the ledgers and we've got a mix of student and community volunteers who have been helping with different parts of the digitisation and the transcribing. And then we've, we've had a number of work integrated learning students. Um, the university next year is going to offer to every, universe, every student at the university what they call a will placement of 120 to 140 hours um, to work on a project. So we can envisage probably next year it might even ramp up a little bit more, but we've been fortunate to have several work integrated learning students. Um, I've just published this blog post this morning. Um, all of our students have worked on various parts of the project, and I think that's where it gets quite interesting, project managing um, something like this when you've got volunteers and students sort of coming and going and, and working on um, parts of the the project because they also want to get quite varied skills so they sort of want, don't want to do too much of the one thing so we try to open up that opportunity so we've got we've had Harper Chelsea Tamara and this semester we're fortunate to have Mackenzie who's with us today um, as a working a graded learning student um, we've got volunteers Sarah and Kay Jessica Lorraine who thinks we're joining us today Lorraine um, Isabel Verity, who's also meeting here, um, she's worked on the project, Colleen and Connie, so a nice mix of students and volunteers working together. Um, I think also the advantage of having that nice mix of people working in the lab together is that they're sharing knowledge. So we've got some of our older community members that have got a lot of knowledge in what they're transcribing and digitising. Um, so the work processes involve digitising the ledgers and the photo negatives, um, transcribing the business ledgers. Now I've only put like a snippet of a section of a page that doesn't have anyone's personal information on it. Um, the ledgers have got mainly um, information around individual clients, um, family portraits and people who sort of booked in to have their like events and engagements. Um, this ledger here shows the industry and business that were also clients. Um, some of them based in Sydney. Here we've got Closters, uh, British Paints. Um, we've got a colliery supplies, um, earth tiles and Y Industries. So already we can see in some of the photographs that were digitised um, that they sort of reflect these industries. This is a photograph of the scanner we're using um, to digitise the ledgers. Because the ledgers are unique items, they're quite fragile, um, we're digitising them in a way that isn't going to um, harm them at all. And then the transcribing goes into a worksheet so because a lot of the ledgers are a hand, um, handwritten, it's important to sort of have that information transcribed so that the document can be searched in the future. So if someone comes in, for instance, and they know they were married on a certain date, had lost their photo photographs, we can sort of search a, a database and bring up that sort of information. Um, this just shows, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen there, but just shows um, the processes involved in any archive or digitisation. Um, Amir's spoken about the conservation, the accessioning means that every negative that's conserved needs to have an accession number. So a lot of that work has sort of been done by Amir. That's when we can start digitising um, the images, the transcribing. The metadata is also really important, so to have keywords and titles that are connected to each file, so photograph, 
So when it does go up online, we're able, people are able to search it and find it. So in a lot of cases, you know, you can sort of put hundreds of images up online, but without that sort of important metadata, um, people aren't going to find what they're looking for. So there's a lot of work then um, before items go up online, but then once they are accessible, we're hoping that we get a lot more information in from the community um, because, as you know, the negatives, they don't really come with much other information. So they're the skills that um, our students are learning. Um, again, some of our older volunteers, um, particularly if they've lived in the Newcastle area for quite a while, they're able to sort of provide that really important, rich information and metadata. We use Google Earth quite a bit. So um, for me, who's like born and bred in Newcastle, I can look at an image and almost get like a gut feeling. And then using Google Earth to go and cross check, um, it's a good way of just seeing whether certain buildings or houses are in the same location and sort of you can verify. Um, someone's dog barking. <laughs> <laughs> this is a photograph of um, when Amir does the conservation on each of the negatives. They're all folded very neatly here um, in acid-free paper and they're designated to um, a leather binder with um, uh, archival sort of um, uh, sheets. And here's an example of a photograph that um, sort of looked at the importance of scanning that at as high resolution as possible is so that we can zoom into any signs. Um, now, I don't know, yeah, here, there's a sign that says Gohiba, so straight away we knew that, okay, could that possibly be Pacific Highway? Not as we know it today, but no, the very know. early. <laughs> um, is, it, is it Highfields? Yeah, so that's Highfields. High yeah. The way we could verify it, of course, the corner shop's no longer there. This house here, um, you can sort of see in the left, it's still there. So cross-checking on Google Earth, I was able to navigate wow. behind the tree and find the house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a little bit of detective work. Mm -hmm. This one again, for people that know um, Nelson's Bay, is the intersection right at the end of Stockton Street. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big marina. Um, that park yeah. is sort of extended out, probably reclaimed land. And again, the signage is really important. So. We can create that metadata. That's what it looks like today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the mix um, of photographs, there's a lot of coal mining and industry that we've digitised. Um, these ones are really lovely because they sort of show um, hotel culture and Port Stephens history, which I think is sort of nice for the community up there. Have a look at the Seabreeze Hotel. Nice old cars. Too. Nice old cars. Um, there's a lot of social history. Um, I will just share now as from 11.30 this morning, we uploaded our first batch of um, Hannah negatives. Thank you to my colleague, Paige Wright, who is a living history's recollect expert. Um, we were able to do a batch upload of a lot of about 470, close to 470 images um, with titles. So again, we're hoping that the community can find these online, add information. For instance, this lady here will be someone's grandmother, auntie, family member, um, and get that important information back from the community to help sort of enrich our our collection even further. Um, so we've created this collection page so all the photos will gradually continue to be uploaded. Um, but again, many thanks to our volunteers and our students that are doing a really fabulous job. Um, and I think it's just a win-win for our students that they're sort of learning a lot of the digital technical skills. Yeah, so these yeah. look, and again, this is going to be a little mini project yeah. for Mackenzie. Um, <laughs> she's really keen to look into these small collection of 
looks like the theatrical performance. No, that's the actually dating thing. back to the medieval period. <laughs> 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 I had come. Okay. Okay. Around Can longer we think. that play was going to call Tony Trick. Oh, you know who that play? Mm. Yeah. Oh, the Paul, Paul took the photographs. Yeah. yeah. So this is sort of the information. Oh, you better yeah. start telling yeah. the um, yeah, so Paul and Carol, if you want to sort of start going through what is going up online or send on okay. to people that you know, um, that's where we can add so much more information. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I think there will be... Um, pockets within the collection as, as it's digitised, it's going to relate to a certain community. So I think as long as we can sort of on-share and get the community involved, um, I think this will be good. Yeah, so they're up there for anyone to, to look at. And, um, and yeah, we're just sort of going to continue with the um, transcribing the metadata so that that will um, in time be yeah, quite an important sort of document. Uh, just to interrupt, sorry, uh, <clears throat> do you want people to uh, put um, comments on these or they describe them online? As you... Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you have to register to, to WordPress? To be able to put comments on that? No, so no. this is on a digital repository. So um, anyone from the community can comment. So if they, they think they know the content, the person, the place, the event, um, they we can. We have some people that are very, very keen um, that become serial updaters and directors mm -hmm. and we bring them in as editors as editors so they then get assigned to the well, just remember this early section is just the the difficult bit all right so these are bits for, for one reason or another haven't we haven't got any envelopes we don't have any numbers necessarily we've got a, a year maybe um so it's the scrappy end of the of the collection once we start getting a bit more systematic and then you start getting into your runs of 10 thousands if we then start to find correlations between the registers and the books that's a lot easier but this area we've started with the worst bit which is just all the yeah mm -hmm. so um hence inviting all you guys around to inform yeah, us on what you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's right but yes. <laughs> it's and, and one other thing is that while we are saying that these are 1950s because that, like the way that they have been stored there may be something from 1960s into yeah. in, in the last So it's kind of like yeah. um, need, need this, that awareness that dates are not exactly. There was it's, it's a fair hard. bit of time at different times when things were misfiled. And yeah. Various people around the place spent a considerable mm -hmm. amount of time looking for a particular yeah. image mm -hmm. when, when uh, well, the mistake was there was someone you know, you took images out of sequence to do something and then they never got <laughs> returned yeah, back. Or they, so there's going to be a lot of that going on. Yeah. See, we thought that some of these student projects could just be targeting little messes, cleaning up little historical messes, um, mm -hmm. putting things back into sequence or, I mean, there could be a myriad of different tasks mm -hmm. that could be done in, in the project. But at the moment, it's just, as you saw with Amir, he's dealing with uh, images that have been stuck together. That This early period is very difficult and you know and also when we collected the images in 2014 from Don I mean we just we'd had a patch of bulk of flood and there were um there was evidence of, of of flood damage on some of the outside of the boxes so you don't know what what these things have gone through themselves so um but we'll get to see them as we as we work as we work through them well I think some got damaged in the water yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they've survived everything from the 1950s, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the earliest images we've been able to see seem to point to about 1953. So that now whether they were inherited by other firms, we don't know. We'll just depend on keeping the communication lines open so that we can jump through. Yeah, <coughs> would have been when Dad left out yeah. Harris and started. Yeah. So then so. I was probably green legs. Yeah. 
Yeah. So all that, that's the sort of thing we're just going to try and unravel. So we might be inviting you back for oral histories, um, interviews, or maybe, I don't know which works better, a group discussion where you can say, oh, no, that, you know, different memories come together. But it's very mm -hmm. important, I think, with this. So as I was saying before, I mean, um, as Amir said, it's a great honour to work on something like this because uh, the disaster that happened in Lismore um, really made an impact on us here. I mean, uh, people were safe, they were okay, but the next thing they started to, to gave their heart aches was the fact that they lost all their, their personal mm -hmm. photographs and images. And I thought at the time, while all those people were suffering, saying that they'd lost mum and they'd lost grandma and they lost their children in this in these um in this flooding, I thought, well, we've got a backup of the entire region here sitting on the walls. Uh, and that's very reassuring that if something happens like that, which the climate scientists tell us we're going to be going through, then we've got that sort of backup there just in case uh, the region needs it. So it's very important that we look after this stuff and have um, almost like a 500 year plan. Uh, with, with, we look at and dealing with, well, it's like building a cathedral for us. You know, we can't have a five year plan, we're going to have a 500 year plan. And it's a generational thing, you know. Um, so if we can start to, I mean, we're delivering a paper on this late in next month um, for the archivists to start getting their heads around these massive collections because we have three of them in the same boat. Uh, we're working on with the MBN archive as well. That's a million foot of footage, but again, it's very similar to what you spent 60 years doing. Um, MBN has spent 60 years doing it in audio visual. Um, and there's a whole range of technologies that they've captured that with. Um, and you know the audio visual history of the region dates back to 1917. So this film footage dates back that early. It's sitting in people's houses, and you know families that had their relatives that done made the film. So these are things. And then the um, the um, oh, what's the research been? The Valley Research Foundation. There's 60 years of archives we've got down there too. Um, I did one of the biggest blog posts, 28,000 words, just. For the listing, <laughs> so it's a huge amount of, of material. The second half of the 20th century was incredibly documented research um, with photography and with audio visual alone. I mean, it's massive. So it's it's very we're, we're a lucky region to have that that um, that backup, you know, basically here. So. All right, so what's next? Um, so on the site, we've also done a history. I work with Paul and Carol and Chris, who all sent me bits and pieces. Um, and um, we've, we've done a history of the Hannon Archive as best as we can with um, people's recollections and everything. So that's up there as well. Um, so Andy, do you want to share your screen if you're being the navigator? Um, So are there any questions on what we've just spoken about so far from the Zoomers? Can I, oh, can I just ask, so, so for example, photos of collieries, did the collieries um, employ you <coughs> to come and take photos? Uh, a mixture. The, um, uh, probably the biggest client uh, was, um, Australian Coal Association, or Magazine Associates. Um, the guy that owned Magazine Associates, <coughs> a guy called Neville Fortescue, uh, also put out a, an annual called Mine and Quarry Mechanisation, which I and another guy bought after his death. Uh, and so so they went into magazines? Yeah, yeah. he had a lot of, uh, he was more of a PR agent, I guess. Um, he had a lot of coal mine companies as clients. Um, a lot of uh, companies came to us direct. Uh, a lot of manufacturers uh, of coal mine equipment like Joy Manufacturing and so on. They, uh, we used to do their photography. So it, there was, an, oh, I don't know, there were maybe 50 or 100 different companies or organisations that had us do work in coal mines. And uh, <coughs> I when we first started doing work in coal mines, uh, they would let you use incandescent lighting as long as they tested for gas first, um, and even flash bulbs. 
Uh, and then there were a number of uh, fires and a few deaths from the explosions in coal mines. So they got really tough on it. And uh, for many years, you weren't even allowed to wear a battery watch underground. Couldn't carry an aluminium tripod because aluminium on rusty steel makes it spark hot enough to ignite methane gas. Um, and lighting became a real problem. So a friend of mine who was working in coal mines uh, is an electronics genius and uh, his wife, and we're still very good friends, his wife's sales. We uh, designed and made a uh, flame-proof electronic flash. Um, we had to make two of them because the mines department had to explode one. <laughs> oh, yes, and right. um, that, was, that was used for many years. Mm -hmm. There was a French one that the mines department had they imported and that was really low power and not much use. Mm -hmm. But the one that we made uh, was used for many years and some of the guys here really used it too. Mm -hmm. Uh, after mm -hmm. I left the company. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, although it had its limitations, I mean, it was, wasn't wonderful for action shots, but if you had a, a long wall uh, mining setup which could go for hundreds of, hundreds of metres, <coughs> you had to set the camera up on a trial and open the, the shutter and then walk along with the, the flash, you know, flashing at the intervals. Um, but that meant that we got most of the underground work in New South Wales and Queensland. Mm -hmm. You developed a re good reputation, obviously. Yeah. Well, they had the equipment, no one else had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the experience. And the experience. <laughs> Could I just ask a quick, quick question about the folios? So are you archiving all of the folios so that people can kind of jump ahead of where you're catching up with, uh, you know, tidying and archiving mm -hmm. the next so that they can go into the collection yeah. and look for something specific. Yeah. So even though it may not be, you know, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. The, the game plan is that the folios basically contain the metadata for the images. So mm -hmm. we've got to get that metadata extracted. We're not copying everything. It's just selected things like the title, the client, the location, yeah. things like that. We've just picked which columns we're going to transcribe yeah. that will give us the most amount of information per image. So once, you know, we've got a connection that we know the play and we'll do a search and see, you know, what year that player was in and get mm -hmm. the details of the actual photo shoot, right? Mm -hmm. But for now, when we've got nothing except maybe a description, that's, yeah. that's what we're going on. But the idea is we're looking at the ledgers, not necessarily as having them all online and open, but just extracting them into... Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it that was a job number? Actually, Lorraine would probably know this. Mm -hmm. I've been doing some other research since, but no, it's thank you for keeping such interesting, legible records. And occasionally, <laughs> yes. you're away and someone else writes them in. And you know, I fortunately learned to write cursive writing, so that makes a big difference as well at deciphering. But um, no, it's, oh, help me, Anne, it's the, the job number. The job number the date, and the, the client. The client's name. So there's a, lo a lot of information, and as Johnny said, it's not for the purpose of putting it up online, because um, we did, uh, there's a lot um, like to do with the cost and the day they came back to yeah. retrieve them and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, having it sort of transcribed then and um, put online just yeah, makes it. It's, it's more to have the record of the images themselves so that we can <laughs> sort of connect it. So all these things are happening at the same time. The register, the, the digitization of the ledgers is happening. The transcription of the ledgers is happening. The conservation of the negatives is happening. Everything's happening all at once. So, so it's then we start tying the little um, connectors together. So, but we started with the with the worst part, the messiest bit, um, because once it starts, once you start getting into, if you saw the picture of Amir against the wall, all those boxes that have got the ten thousand numbers, they're all fine. That would be easy. I remember. You asked me some questions about stuff that predated me by a fair bit and yeah. I couldn't answer no. it. And that's, I, you know, hopefully with Carol and Paul, they yeah. been nice enough to help you. I think we should do some in introductions. So Paul, Hannon and Carol, um, 
they're sort of the elders of the, of the firm. <laughs> I'm a baby. <laughs> We've got everyone from the el surviving elders to the babies of the firm. But it, <laughs> um, so maybe if we just did some introductions as we go on a round table. So this will be a mixture of questions, but a mixture of also uh, reminiscences and things that you remember from your particular period. So do you want to start? Well, if we go back a couple of slides, yeah, there's an interesting story about um, uh, the uh, <coughs> pouring of that um, trunk in me. That one, that one there, yeah. that shot. Uh, that was taken at Comsteel. Uh, it was the pouring of a 50 ton uh, Trundian ring, which is shown in that, the next one of it being machined at Gininnens. But the pouring of, there were two arc furn electric arc furnaces at Comsteel, <coughs> and they both had to be come, uh, come on heated at about the same time. Uh, it was supposed to happen at midnight one night, and I'd set up a number of um, um, you know, magnesium filled flash bulbs around the place uh, and photographed it on a 5 by 4 inch colour transparency. So you only get one shot because you haven't got time to run around and change all the flash bulbs, you know, do another shot. But <clears throat> there was a hold up um, in the timing of the furnaces coming to the right heat. And uh, the guys who were working there had knocked off a crib or something around midnight. And I was sitting around eating sandwiches and drinking the Coca Cola out of cans. And one of the guys said to me, It's like, okay. I said, No, I'm right, thanks. He said, No, go on. No. So I had a drink of this Coca Cola and it was beer. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys had split Coca Cola cans and then rewelded them a little bit bigger so they just fit a can of beer. And here they are, handling molten steel, you know, a half a, a half shot. <laughs> <laughs> so are these all from Con Steel? No, those for the first Is this stuff. BHP? I think that one's BHP. The next one's Com Steel. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I labelled that one as Com Steel. Yeah, so we're backwards and sure forwards so we're doing this thing. To, oh no, I think it's that. Have a look in the ledger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's right. March so, koalas. So yeah. I mean every phase of um, human life, from family life to events uh, to industrial to construction, is, is recorded in this fashion. Fashion, everything. That was Ganinans. That Ganinans. Is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, that's that's the yeah Trunian ring that yeah. was being poured at Comsteel. We then went to Ganinans and it was uh, machined. It's got you know. So can can uh, you click on that image and then click on it again? There you go. Yeah. So. <laughs> What would that have been used for? It's I, enormous. I can't remember. I was there when they did that. I was working at Gin at the time. No. <laughs> Were you drinking beer too, Doug? <laughs> I, was just, I was working a milling machine just uh, next to that. <laughs> what was it for? Yeah. That's, 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 called, that's, a, that's generating the form, the, that machine. It's a, it's a gear shaper. Oh, what did they actually use it for at the end? But that, that was used for a ball mount. Mount Sawley. Mount Sawley. Thanks, Bob. Mm. Well, there you go. See, that's the community hive line yes. at work. Yes. Um, so the idea is we're advocates of the ancient author Longinus. So on the theory of the sublime, he said, whatever you do, you're only doing half the story. Um, the community or the audience does the rest. So you put out a story, an image, and you'll find the community will fill in the bits and pieces. Um, so this was interesting because I had a look at the photographs of... Um, Diana, when she toured Newcastle, and she wasn't wearing the same outfit, no, so that you were able to tell me that yeah. she was at a different location. So there's all these little, you can't always assume. Um, 
That was actually taken to the Queensland Sugar Board. You took that one, Andrew. Okay, that's good. See, the other good thing is also acknowledging the photographers that took the shots too. I mean, John Fruin down the end there, there, there are heaps of university photographs that John took, but there's no acknowledgement of John anywhere. It was a good way to keep it. It is. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to have our names pinned in the pictures. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, you would like the good ones anyway. So there are some bios up there. Um, the beautiful thing about the, the Hunter Living Histories is it's almost like the sandpit where we sort of work out, you know, people can have their arguments in the sandpit and we use the Living Histories data platform as the definitive sort of place. So if you're going to have your discussions, and this is the listings of all the ledgers that we've got. I'm, um, I'm devastated I'm not listed on that list of people. Oh, well, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're listed. You just don't have a Here, go back, get down. Andrew? Where? I did ask for bios, so you know I'll add them in. Um, so just you look at this site as a work in progress. So all these sites are works in progress. So unidentified firms, you can see what we're talking about when there's overlaps with the ledgers that we've got. Um, so there's um, yeah, so there's interesting things we'd like to sort of nut out and solve. Who's taking what? Um, if there are images from other firms, we'd like to be able to understand who those other firms are. So we can get the provenance right in the in the living history so we know who's taken the shots and when. So um, so we were able to do a pretty good history um, uh, overview of the various um, organisations. That's so, Peach Advertising Party. Mm -hmm. Peach, yeah. Are you in that chill? Yeah, oh, I'm there? just there above the lady in the red hat. Oh, oh that's you, okay. Hey, Carol will be there. And Paul, Paul's down the front. Okay. Carol, where are you, Carol? No, I don't know that I was there that day. Oh. Over there. Oh, no. Okay. I was there. There's some aerial photography too. Aerial, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so the majority of what we've been doing looks as if they're in black and white, um, so 1950s, but yeah, these yeah. late ones are... The problem, really the problem with the earlier colour photography would be that the uh, clients would have all the transparencies. It was all done on transparency until the colour negative came out. Mm. So there'd be very little of that this on the, in the files. Yeah. And with uh, a lot of things like ship launchings, um, we'd have a number of photographers that depend on the scale of the, uh, the, the, the ship. And that, um, yeah, you know, sort of a, a large launching, we might have four or five photographers on it. It was just a small one. We always had two just in case somebody had a camera malfunction or uh, so yeah, yeah we've, if, we've got about 11 cartons of just Carrington slipways, um, which is pretty good for Bob Donnelly and the team over in the um, Newcastle Hunter, Newcastle Industrial Heritage Association that are very interested in industrial photography. So um, I showed him the six, I don't know, 11 boxes of Carrington slipways alone. So it's yeah. well, Carrington slipways the pro did progress shots. And that was pretty okay, so like every two weeks. Every two weeks. Ah, besides, so it's in there too. Uh, yeah, that'd be included in that. So it's not just launching. the launch of the ship, it's actual construction. Yeah, oh. yeah there's, there's a full photographic record of the construction of every ship. Okay. Fantastic. So that showed the, the owners the providence of the documentation and the tattering to slip away. That's excellent. Um, was providing to them to get progress payments. Yes. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Did we? We would have done kind of sick from the time they moved to um, Tomago. I don't, don't think we have a lot from when they were in Newcastle Harbour at Carrington. But Don Labrick, I still see on occasions. He's in his 90s now and he's got some of that stuff if you want to show some. Okay. That's good to see. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, look, what I'd suggest we do is introduce ourselves when we talk. So, um, Paul, you start an introduction to yourself and, and Carol as well, since you're the earliest, you're the you're the one of the founders, the original founders, along with your parents. <laughs> um, Paul Hannon, my wife Carol. Um, we both worked at Hannon's uh, virtually 
from before we were married. Carol was my receptionist at Greenleaf City Studio. Um, so but we've been associated with it until I uh, got involved with advertising and uh, in about uh, probably 1980s. Uh, I got more involved in that and less in photography, but until when, uh, I, as well as being, uh, I guess, the main industrial photographer in the business after my dad died um, when I was 30. Um, I was also looking after all the other studios. We had uh, Maltford Studio in the arcade, which was a wedding studio, and John Frew and, and, and Robert Shaw, who's here, um, both worked there for many years. Um, that was the biggest uh, candid studio in Newcastle. Um, and I think the record one weekend was 11 weddings, it might have been more. Do you remember? Quite a few. <laughs> was, it was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, we had one of the brides. Every, every weekend, you know, you just sort of, your heart in your mouth, hoping somebody, some photographer wouldn't ring up and say, the camera's packed up or the flash is packed up. And you'd race off with another set of gear or something. Um, and we had model studios in Maitland and Curry, which were portrait and wedding photographers. Greenleaf Studio in Hampton Heights and Greenleaf City Studio, which, which previously that was Hilton Robinson Studio. So my father worked for, uh, well, he, he did his apprenticeship at um, Freeman Studios in Sydney. They were the vice regal photographers uh, and then worked for Howard Harris, uh, <coughs> which was a chain of studios um, before the Second World War, uh, which I, uh, and by a guy named Blackett. And uh, I think all the, the photographers in the different studios had share some sort of share profit agreements with Blackett's. Uh, and I know that was at um, Crocodile Studios in Cessna. And then when the war started, Hilton Wilkinson was the manager of the Newcastle Howard Harris Studio, and he was a conscientious objector. Uh, so he uh, was asked to leave and Dad went in there um, and that was a really big show. And as you can imagine that at that time um, everybody going away to war was getting their portrait taken sort of stuff uh, and I think they had 35 staff at Howard Harris in Morgan Street in Newcastle. I can remember sort of working there as um, yeah. At, uh, school holidays and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, Dad bought Maltfern Studios while he was working there. Mr. Blackett um, apparently said to Dad, I assume you bought it for both of us. So he said, no, I bought it for me. So, <laughs> so that they came a parting of the ways. Uh, and Dad, who was Dad and who were living at Neil Hampton Heights at Greenway Studio at Lookout Road, which has just since just recently been demolished, by the way. Um, set up a, a photographic dark room down the stairs um, and a studio in the lounge room. Um, and it sort of grew from there. Uh, the dark room underneath the uh, studio was a bit of a rabbit warren. We actually dug out. Um, Every time we needed another dark room, we dug out some more. We couldn't go on, but grab wood, put in some more Irish chairs, and ended up with a number of dark rooms. And it's costing a fortune for the new trial to write. They write past the grout that holds <laughs> 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 I'm really surprised. Um, yeah, so um, it just sort of grew from there, I guess. Uh, my father died. Um, I forget the year, when I was 30, so it's really 1972. Uh, and um, from then on, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, it just, I, I personally um, did mainly commercial and industrial photography, and I got into making film, TV commercials, and so on, and uh, then went from that into. Um, television, film, television production, 
um, and um, that sort of developed in the peach productions and peach advertising. And mm -hmm. I sort of worked my way out of the ham side of it and into that. Um, but, you know, along the line, we had some really good guys working for us, and some of the top photographers in Australia, really. Mm -hmm. Some of them are here today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad you put that last bit in. <laughs> That's great. So uh, anyway, I, I just have to say I, I was thrilled to hear this was happening. I didn't know what had happened to the uh, all the negatives after we sold the, the business. And um, it's just, I don't know, you. I have never um, really worried too much about history. Um, I've been too busy working and making money and whatever. I've, I've given away dozens of really nice cameras. I go to people's houses and they've got old cameras. I thought, oh, I'd one of those, I'd one of those. I'd one of those. <laughs> you know, I remember we had a, a 20 by 16 inch plate camera that rotted away behind the back fence. Very less because we had nowhere else to put it. You know, silly things. Um, but when you get to my age, uh, things like this become more important to you, and they're certainly important to uh, our children. I know they're thrilled to hear that's happening, and grandchildren, and great grandchildren. Um, so I guess I thank you for for um, taking over my neglect, I guess, and <laughs> doing something with it. It's a, it's a thrill for both of us. I know. You want to say something? I haven't got much to say. <laughs> I, I didn't ever work full time in the studios because I had three children. Um, so sort of worked as a bulk and then, you know, um, had time off. And but don't underplay any of that. You know, there's a new book out on the market about George Orwell's yes. wife. And exactly. there's this sort of big, um, big, I mean, Vera Deacon, late Vera Deacon, always used to hassle us to say, look, it's not just single guys that do anything, you know, the women sort of provide the um, environment by which yeah. people can do things. So it should be, you know, you should recognise everybody, you know. So George Orwell's wife now needs to be um, part of the story about how Animal Farm was created and, as you said, everything else. So. Well, I think I was just lucky when Paul left the business that we had great people who came on board, photographers and people who worked in the dark room, and it just went along very, very nicely with good so how did you work? I mean, so many photographic firms doing things. How, how did you sort of sort it? What was going on with all this activity going on? Uh, I guess various people had various responsibilities. Um, you know, I, I always believed in giving people a job to do and then letting them do it. Um, and uh, I think uh, that paid off. Both in Hammonds and in Peach. Um, I think most of the guys in the different studios were left to run their own race. Um, so, so in those ledgers that we have, um, the handwriting, whose who's handwriting is that? That's yours. It's not all of it. No, no. It's not all of it. Quite a lot. It's probably yours. Because you were just about to. Oh, yeah, my it's mother's. It's in the early stuff. It was always than yours. Right, and so then stave off the, the clapping yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but well, that's going to be pretty crucial in yeah. sorting out, you know, all everyone's photographs and things. So, John, yeah, so introduce just, yourself. John. Uh, oh, John Ferrand, um, been everywhere, done everything. <laughs> pretty well. Ex university photographer. But one of the things Paul said, um, he left us to our own devices quite a bit, and, you know, we'd go out and do all sorts of different sort of styles of photography. And one day he said to me, he said, can you tell me, what do you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'll go away and think about that and come back. But you, you sort of went to work and you did everything that was around it. Like I, I worked with Anne at uh, Molson Studio quite a bit and um, I, I had a, a little Toyota Corolla U panel van thing and we used to race around town advertising Molson Studio with green leaves on it. And uh, it, was, it was a really good little um, advertising thing because it was everywhere. Um, at one stage I lived in Toronto, so it got a fair bit of graphic work there. And then when we moved into town, it also got a fair bit of uh, advertising there. But um, it, it was, yeah, we, we all did our own thing. Like I, I didn't uh, hassle Anne too much. I'd go in there and spend a little bit of time if there was a like a session, a photo shoot on, uh, I'd be delivering 
product in there from the green leaves dark rooms. Then I'd be taking stuff out to green leaves, and um, it, it was it worked out really well. We all sort of worked in together. So you're working across firms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, then there were the other guys from Greenleaves that who you'll probably get to in a moment. That they, they were doing like uh, booked in commercial work and um, high end stuff, industrial work, all that type of thing. And I think I was doing low end used car shots for Saturday's paper <laughs> and stuff like that. But it, it was good fun. And um, you go out and you shoot for different car yards and all that. So, what period are you talking about here, John? This and is what, the what, 70s. 70s, and how old were you then? 14. No, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't remember. Oh, yes. uh, probably the way you were close. Mid 35, something like that. Okay. But um, I, I enjoyed that because I'm a car fanatic as well. So I used to love going to car yards and photographing cars, looking around, then get going. And um, and I did a little, I, I was doing a little bit of work before I went to work full time for Paul with a model agency. And uh, my wife actually got me involved in that. And I started doing a bit of work through Morphine Studio with a model agency. And, and that was a bit of fun. It taught me a lot about photographing and working with people, as well as all the weddings we were shooting. Like on a, a wedding Thursday, before the weddings, we'd go into Malfern and Anne would have typed out, you used to type that out, didn't you? Yeah. The job sheets. Yeah. So there'd be a job sheet for the weekend with all the jobs that the photographers had to do. We had all the details um, of where we had to be at a certain time to photograph the bride at home, go to the church, park maybe after and the reception, and Paul used to uh, have a little rule that we, we stayed till the bride and groom left so they get dressed and away they go. That, that worked out quite well. It was good. Yeah, we spent a fair bit of time there, <clears throat> except for one time at Mayfield, I was shooting a wedding, and the bride and groom left and went out to Gateshead to get changed. But they were back within 35 minutes, and I thought, Cute. That was good. You know, like it's 11 o'clock, 11.15, I'm thinking, God. Anyway, they forgot the key. So they went back out the gates and they changed. And I thought, Paul will understand this. I went home. <laughs> but there were a lot of fun. We met an amazing amount of people, made a lot of friends, um, and learned an awful lot about people and photography. Yeah. And um, didn't have to go to uni, didn't have to go to TAFE. It was all through green leaves and morphine. It's the best way of education. Yeah. Then I came here. But that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, do you want to say something else? Oh, I've, got, I've got the Zoom <laughs> camera on you. No, it's okay. You sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll just I'll say a few words. I started um, working for um, Hat, well, Hannah's, but with Paul was my boss at the time um, when, in 1966. So I was 17. That's given away my age. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, and just very busy, very busy. It was, it included me when I started working there. There was three of us working there, three girls, in a little, tiny little area. Yeah, and we, we managed. And then we used to do passport photos when, with the Polaroids and, and Paul would do some shots in there as well with kids who'd come in and get their photos taken because Paul's our boss then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really But you were photographers as well? You were I didn't do weddings. Okay. No. That was we enough for everybody else. But I'd do passport photos and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. But it was um yeah mainly looking after oh, it was a it's busy place. It was so busy. Like could not be, you know, because they did everything, balls, graduation ceremonies, everything. And then back then, you had to come in and have a look at your, your mm -hmm. proofs and things like that. So it was time consuming, yeah. all that with people. But it was all word of mouth. I mean, they, they just kept coming back because people, well, there's photographers around. Like. And then, of course, the photographer, all the photographers got known. And they'd ask for that photographer, you know, and that was sort of went on from there. It was yeah, sort of word of mouth. But then um, down the track, all obviously pulled was it the manager then after that. And then there was a girl, another girl, and then down the track, me, that we used to look after the girls. Yeah. And uh, always good staff, but it was a very busy place. 
It was only probably the last, I don't know, probably 10, not 10 years. Six years, maybe, started to get slow. Mm. I think that when I worked there for 20 years, Mark's family took over. I think, yeah, I think in, um, I think it was three years, was it? Three or four years. Three or four years, he was there, they had it. So I still kept working for them. And that time was difficult because people were yeah. weddings and mm -hmm. things like that, and I think it was more. So um, unfortunately, yeah, closed. But I was lucky I got a, my next job was with Tui's <laughs> Brewery <laughs> on the reception. So, and that was only a couple of months later, so I was very lucky. Yeah, well, but I was very happy, it, it love, obviously, because I loved working there and had great bosses. and. I love Paul's dad. He's just the nicest man. He's the nicest mm -hmm. man. It was very sad when he passed away. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. we're all here because so, of mm -hmm. what he started. Anyway. But I made you know, a, lot, a lot of friends. But people would used to come up to me and say, oh, how are you? Do you have any photos? Mm -hmm. Not me personally, but all oh, right. You know, I couldn't remember them because it was too many. You know, yeah. oh, well, part of this is kind of terror because of the number of people that will contact us about particular things. Mm -hmm. um, but look, it's just going to have to be, you know, as steady as you go, you know. And in some cases, once we get a handle on when uh, photographs are taken, we have some way of finding things anyway. So there is a handle on that. It's just that the early period is going to be a bit, a bit patchy. Yeah. yeah. So, so Mark, you're you became the owner of Maltford for a while yeah. yes yes yeah. okay and i operated a bit from home and then i went on to work with lloyd at cooks hill for two well, years we, i'm putting names now <laughs> i've only corresponded to by email <laughs> yeah. so but i related to somebody a couple of months ago that the reason I can still take reasonably good photographs is because Paul, years ago, would pick up a photograph and say, "If I knew, when I find out who took that, my God, <laughs> that's the end of them sort of thing. Yeah. So you learn very early in the case. So you strict teaching. You, you do not do this, you do not do that. And the big thing that I've seen over the years is uh, I mean, I've had a digital camera for quite a while and I use it like a film camera in as much as you didn't waste film, but you don't push the shutter button unless the light's in the eye the right way or there's not a telegraph pole coming out of someone's bed. <laughs> and Paul taught me that. Yeah. And at home I've got my baby photographs and my brother's baby photographs taken by Paul's father. Yes. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think um, Jude was married by Maltford. Yes. I'm not married by Maltford. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm overblowing your uh, company's uh, reach. Um, but you were you were photographed by Maltford. Oh, no, 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 no. no, I've actually uh, got uh, at least two of them displayed now in my house so, because I've got a lovely one of me and my grandmother. So when, you know, at the end of the marriage, when you're about to go away, you go around in a circle and say goodbye to everyone when you get married in those days. And so there's a lovely one of me and my grandmother and there's also a lovely one of me with my father. So I've got two of those photos framed and displayed right now. So black and white or are they yes. colored? Black and white. Oh, I did have a few coloured, mm -hmm. but um, I we were very when I got married to uh, we were both students. We were very poor, mm -hmm. and I couldn't afford to. I've got a big album of all little photos, yes. but we could only afford to buy a few. So there were some mm -hmm. coloured photos. It's interesting what Mark was saying there about framing a picture before we push the button. I watch the grandkids, you know, with phones and digital cameras and you know, blaze away. And I still can't get out of the habit when I go to take a photograph of just taking one shot, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Chris, you were mentioning before, well, just about everybody here predated me. 
Carol and Lloyd behind you. Yep. I think um, it would be good to for them to jump in themselves. After me. Yes. Um, I was at Hannon's from uh, 1978 to 1985, and uh, further what Paul was saying earlier, it wasn't a nine to five job. It's um, you mm -hmm. know ship launching could be at night or. Mm -hmm. um, some very strange times <laughs> or timing um, and you just had to be there because they, they don't with a ship launching they don't hold it up for you <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah no they were good good times and uh, we all still got on really well but uh, it, was, it was like a family really yeah it's exactly yeah. right probably still is yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I was very lucky I immigrated out here and Paul and Carol employed me as um, a printer, actually, black and white printing, and then I went on to colour printing, and then Paul, Kit Jack Paul, taught me how to take portraits, and so I ended up taking over all the portraits when Paul went to Beach. Yeah, so I was very privileged. I loved it. And you did a good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, would, I arrived here in 76 and I think I left in about 82. Okay. Yeah. Right. So who's next? Andrew. Andrew. I'm Andrew. Um, I was privileged from 74 to 80. I was there. Great growth of Newcastle. As Carol said, family. It was great to go to work, it wasn't. Yeah. An effort, it was fun. Um, brilliant time, a lot of good, great training. I still photograph today, I won't retire, touch wood. <laughs> and uh, just enjoy what you do. We're visual historians, mm -hmm. and that's what we do. And thank God that the legacy lives on through the system. Mm -hmm. We're only here for a moment, but our lives will live forever mm -hmm. with what we've captured. So we're being good in that way. But it was just such an interesting thing to go underground. Mm -hmm do aerial stuff, um, all the industries and stuff. And it's why it's such a great job, because every day was different. Mm -hmm. All organised by that woman. Mm -hmm. And paid by us as well. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was just, just a brilliant job to have. And well, the photography is always the most important part. That's what people always go for first. Is the photography, you know, the picture tells a thousand words and all that sort of stuff. But the emotional reaction that photography brings to people, especially when they they see a picture of a loved one or they've been through some catastrophe or something, and it's just we're always doing this in terms of the images that we have up online. There's always people writing to us about some kind of incredible thing that's happened because of that connection. You know, so you're right. You know, it's very important work. That you do or continue to do, and um, you know, could I ask a question? Yeah. You are the person who said yes. We're the historians now for the future. My curiosity is that what will the archive for the future generations of Amir look like when everything's digital? Sits in a cloud, you die. Nobody knows how to get it, where it is, or whatever. Well, how do you manage that type of history minus, into the future? Yeah. Um, I've got a guy who is archiving a lot of my images. I've been back How? in the country since 92. Okay. So and Newcastle's changed a lot from there with all the industry, yeah. aerial photos and stuff like that. So that's mm -hmm. being archived in a, a digital form. Digital. And also there is a negative form as well. So, oh, okay. so it's all categorised, similar system to what was at Greenleys, but a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I've got... I'm up to job number 3,700, I think. But some of those jobs have over 100 jobs within one job. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of slightly different system, but mm -hmm. similar. So. Oh, I'm just very curious. In a commercial environment, I know, but I don't know how people are doing it personally. Mm -hmm. So you're still being employed. Stuff. I mean, it's like the assumption is when the digital era came in with everyone's mobile phone. Who, who, it dropped off, I believe, a little bit, but then people realised the benefit. I've done even five corporate headshots this morning. People oh. come in and get uh, shots done and so forth. So they don't just say pull out your mobile phone and take a picture of me this morning. Mobile phones are brilliant. 
However, you still need the hard copy mm -hmm. in a professional way. And thanks to these guys, the training we had. Mm -hmm. So, are we up to you now, Chris? Yes. Um, so you were the first contact we made. I don't. I can't remember how it happened. But I, you helped us well, out to surf how, how, how we came into contact was Surf Fest was asking for images um, of the, you know, uh, they had more recent stuff, a lot of more recent stuff, but they didn't have anything back in the, the day the Surf Fest started. So through Hannans, we uh, were working through Beach Advertising and, and BHP was their client. And they commissioned us to take photographs of the very first Surf Fest to do public relations photographs to kind of um, to show BHP's involvement. So our photographs were quite different to the, the surfing shots and they would, they would, you know, at the time you didn't think that how valuable they might be later on. They showed the size of the crowds, the sort of signage, you know, sort of um, the structure of how things were set out. And um, so I did the first couple, Lloyd did some first surface stuff. And um, so I, I got in, I knew I'd been talking with uh, Don McCurry and um, I kind of had a contact with him when he was kind of, he's had gone through life changes and packing all these things up. And he talked about, you know, donating the stuff to the university. So I knew that the, the archive was out here. So I got in touch with John and suggested that he might be holding some stuff here. And I oh, helped us find it. I, yeah, I, I came out and I could kind of, uh, well, would, you know, gave him a rundown of how the, the information, what uh, interpretation of the information in the, in the folios of what it all meant. Because until you understand, it's very simple. But unless you understand it, it's kind of a, a different yeah, language. Right. And so um, Andrew's followed through with a similar one. I started my own studio later on, and I followed through with the same sort of uh, way of, of uh, documenting my stuff as well. And uh, I went through with John, and we found the boxes, and we found those particular necks. And so that they were able to be scanned and added into the, the 30th uh, anniversary. Um, mm -hmm. Very happy about that, mm -hmm. Scott. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I I came in. I was studying art uh, first of all through TAFE and then at the uh, university, and doing weddings part time to help stay alive. Uh, bumped into Andrew on some of those, and um, I went and, and um, did some voluntary um, work um, for, uh, you know, sort of, uh, what do you call it, a, a work placement, the kind of... The job experience, job experience. Work job experience. experience. Yeah. Uh, met Paul and Carol and everybody else. So when, um, just before... Um, the, the end of 1979, I bumped into Andrew at a wedding and he said he was going to hand in his notice, give Paul plenty of notice. Um, and uh, let, let Paul know that I was out there still looking for a job. And we got in touch and I started working. Um, I was 26 at the junior and I learned so much from everybody. Um, the uh, you know, John, everybody all contributed to kind of uh, Lloyd with uh, his commercial experience and Andrew with his before he left. He, he passed over a lot of information to me um, about what he what did photographically, how to handle myself out in an industrial environment, uh, particularly underground work, um, which was, you know, sort of one of Andrew's fortes. And uh, so I was able to gain all of this experience. And I worked as Paul's assistant for, you know, for a fair while uh, before I sort of got the courage to kind of do things 
uh, myself didn't be, feel that I was confident enough to be a good photographer. Um, but uh, others have spoken about it. Paul basically let us be autonomous. And um, basically each of the commercial photographers had their own clients and we looked after them, but under the umbrella of the, the studio so that everybody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, you know, a great environment, almost a cooperative in some ways, as far as working with, uh, you know, like I said, different clients with, within the, the whole structure of the thing. And, uh, and as Andrew has pointed out, for the, some of the work that we did, uh, you know, from aerial underground, maritime, so many different things, industrial, it uh, was just a great experience. Every day was very, very different. Mm. I think that was probably the major appeal to me about the job was you just saw so much behind the scenes stuff mm. in so many industries. Mm. And uh, and not only that, you developed a lot of, well, I developed a lot of personal friendships too with clients, you know, clients, we had clients for years and years. Um, BHP was a big one, obviously, and I ended up getting very friendly with, um, with uh, Jack Wisby, who only died recently, and then his successor, uh, Rob Chenery. Um, he ended up, I invited him to join the board of Newcastle Cruising Yacht Club when we started that, and uh, he was there until he moved to uh, Wollongong. But one of the closest friendships I I formed it with a guy called Clive Longstaff, who um, worked for CSR. <coughs> he was the head of CSR's PR division, and CSR look, also looked after the Queensland Sugar Board. And he was looking for a photographer. I, they'd used Max Japan for years, and Max was getting on a bit and costing a lot of money. And Max always towards the end, insisted on bringing an assistant with him and he used to charge for the assistant as well. Um, I got a few jobs and then got all the work, <clears throat> but he used to organise shoots. Every year we'd do the uh, annual report for CSR and the Queensland Sugar Board. We'd go to all the different sugar mills each year and uh, he always organised it. So we had a, <coughs> a an aerial photo photograph not photographic assignment me to do early in the morning or late in the evening so that we could then land at an appropriate island resort to spend the night. <laughs> and we, we managed to stay just at all the island resorts of Queensland. But it, <laughs> he was also, he'd been, a, uh, he'd been in the Royal Navy and uh, when he came to Australia, he joined the Naval Reserve. He was a commander. Uh, and a very proper Englishman, but he'd send you an engraved uh, card in a tissue. Commander Long, Clive Longstaff requests that uh, the presence of Carolyn Paul Hannon on HMA as such and such, on such and such a date, you know. And he'd, he'd turn up in Newcastle Harbour and he'd have a, he'd have a uh, patrol boat for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, linen silk service and everything. But we formed a very close friendship, and I found my close friendships with a lot of clients actually. It was good. Wonderful. Well, can I say something? Yeah, sure. Which I said before. Um, I, I agree with Andrew that it was like working for family. That's what they were. But they also had the best Christmas parties. Oh, yeah. the best Christmas parties, weren't they? Uh, it was. Oh, I reckon ours was good. We used to go out in the lake and, oh, it was a great Christmas party. And it was all always everybody, you know, like staff. It was, so there's quite a few of them. But they were the best Christmas parties. I know. Not we all were when, after it, but anyway. <laughs> but they were. Well, you so should send us a few notes so we know what to expect. Oh, I just want to. How come there were two different photographers at a wedding? That's what I want to know. How, do, how come you ran into? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
we were working at the Nova Castry or something. I can't remember. It was up near the beach, oh, and they had a wedding venue at either end. Nah, and I was you. shooting for a different studio. <laughs> I was, I was just shooting one wedding, to, you know, and you Andrew know. was shooting. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't explain that. Bit. Yeah, he he was shooting for Malfern. Yeah. Whoever made the bride look prettier got the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was actually shooting for Friedman Studio at two different events. <laughs> You've got to remember back in those days there were 30 photographers give and take around Newcastle, so we kind of all knew each other. We bumped into each other. Now there's over 200. Oh, yeah. uh, anyway. But I think the big success with Greenleaves was we didn't really have egos, and like I'm better than you, we all just merged really comfortably, worked with each other, knew our limits, knew what we could do. He was more intelligent than me with certain things <laughs> and so forth. But then introduction of all the colour processing from black and white to colour, to transparency processing, that was revolutional yeah. in what we did there. We all learned it somehow and prayed to the photo god that the image turned out and the power didn't go off and the chemicals were mixed properly and the temperatures were right and everything yeah. else. Is, uh, Okay. It was just a great time. So time is of the essence. I've got the baby of the group. Gillian, would you like to say something? Do you mind if I take a photo? Well, I wasn't a photographer. But I started, I was at college after school when I was 17. And I was studying photography there. And during this year, I put a call into the school to see if there was anyone who might be interested in a job. And so I hadn't finished it, but I thought I might as well. So that's how I met Paul and Carol. Paul wasn't really there. He was sort of starting to move on to Peach at that time, because it was 1985. Mm -hmm. So then I worked in the dungeon, underground, in the dark. It was like a coal mine. It was. Like a coal mine. It was. <laughs> um, and I did all the black and white printing, all the black and white processing. I did colour printing, because you did it by hand. So you're in pitch black. So you have to set your machine up and then, you know, shine it down onto your paper and then find your way over to the printer, put it in the printer to come out the other side and whatever. So I was there and then we moved into Hall Street in town. So I was still with them. <coughs> and then I think, yeah, they were massive big studios there, wasn't it? We had the big printers and whatever else. Then you sold it and I stayed there, didn't I? And I sort of took over from Carol, doing what Carol, and still printing and everything like that. And then, yeah. and Carl Hoffman, you know, I went with Chris and Carl Hoffman mainly. And then um, then I went to Peach Advertising and I did print production there and then I ended up helping produce the television commercials. Jill tries to make my shots look good. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but that's the thing. They didn't know what they were going to look like and then you'd get it out of the machine and that was when you saw whether it worked or not. You know, and you had to colour correct it and, you know, it was very, very involved. Yeah. Very involved. Because it's all hand done and not like today. Burn in, hold back. Yeah, you, you would hold your hand over the light coming down and make that a bit brighter or a bit darker or change the colour by one cc and, yeah. It's one of the things with digital work now that people won't know what the dodging and burning tool meant. Mm. Dodging and burning meant holding back, dodging and burning it, adding extra light to the yeah. drink. By hand, yeah. That's interesting. Like, I can remember saying to Dad, well, uh, Dad was telling me about how they used to take photographs at, or print photographs at uh, Freeman's in Sydney. Mm. And if somebody came in, and wanted a 10 by 8 photograph, that photograph them on a 10 by 8 sheet of film. Oh, really? A 20 by 16, that photograph yes. on a 20 by 16 sheet of film. Would and you then believe? Down. No. And I said, how did you dodge it? Because they used to print them on a, on a um, sandwich, I think, with uh, you know, flashed over glass yeah. or whatever. He said, oh, we used to tear up little bits of tissue paper and Put it on the on the areas where you want less exposure. Wow. Yeah. Imagine how long that takes. Yeah. All right. Well, look, we've come to the end of the session. I'd say there's uh, three minutes for anyone to ask any questions, if there are. A lot of the NBN and animal crossover too, because a lot of times you go and do a TV shoot, you'd have a still photographer there as well. well so I mean, they were the same. Yeah, like, and Lloyd's name comes yeah. up a lot with the NBN guys. So. Yeah. 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 Film. <laughs> what are the two crew, John and you know the main ones that did all the film work on River there? Aaron and Carol.
No, John, the film guy and the writing guy. It was a Terry. Terry. Yeah. Terry yeah. and John. Terry Bush. And yeah, Terry Bush. Terry and John. He just lost her. Oh, did he? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Terry Bush and John was the lion. She likes Turkish delight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still got a mate? Yes. Anyway, thank you very much. Just for a quick, quick sorry. request. Just a quick request, and you don't have to answer it. While everybody is here, I think what makes this collection even more rich and valuable is having your voice and your stories. So uh, me and Anna are think we're thinking of getting the opportunity to, at some point, interview people who are involved in it. So if you were thinking, if you are thinking and are comfortable that it's a good idea, maybe you contact Anne and John, and then we organize some oral history or video history, whichever you like better. Um, and thank you everyone for making the time to share this with us. Um, it's meant a lot. I think it's great. Thank you for all the presenters for the updates on how things have been going. As I said, we're just, scratching the surface, it's only the beginnings. And, um, but thanks very much for your cooperation and uh, sharing your knowledge. And we hope to continue the relationship into the future as will the rest of the Hunter region because it's, it's gonna have to be a shared, um, shared project. Thank you very much all the Zoomers out there in Zoom land. Thank you for coming in. And uh, we'll see you next month. Our next meeting is on September the 11th. Um, and we should have a return to Yellower Place with uh, Paul Walsh, um, writer, and, um, and some other things which we will get to in due course. Anyway, thank you very much and farewell. Thank you.